So welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Brittany Keller Hamilton, a tobacco control researcher at The Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by Catherine McLean at Temple University, Mike Pesco at Georgia State University, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. Today's seminar will be one hour, with questions asked by the moderator and the discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. Today's presentation is being video recorded. It will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. And now I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Brittany. Today, Max Chumas will lead a traditional paper presentation entitled Effect of Tobacco Regulation on Prenatal Smoking and Infant Mortality. Max uh, Chumas is a fourth year economics PhD student at Georgia State University. His research is primarily in the field of health economics. He is currently interested in researching how tobacco and e-cigarette regulations can impact combustible tobacco use, health outcomes, and time use. Our discussion today is Catherine McLean. Max will be presenting his research in two segments. We will have one pause after each segment to allow for questions. Max, thank you for presenting for us today. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Um, let me just. Okay, so thanks everyone uh, for having me today. Um, as Dr. Shang said, my name is Max Chalmers, and I'll be presenting the paper entitled um, The Effect of Tobacco Regulation on Prenatal Smoking and Infant Death. This is joint work with uh, Dr. Mike Pesco, also from GSU. Um, just as kind of a disclaimer, when I initially applied for TOPS, this paper was almost ready to be sent out for review and perhaps publication. However, um, due to a kind of a almost kind of a, a spring of different uh, difference in different methods, we kind of had to go back and redo a lot of our results. So at this point, it's kind of more of like um, initial um, results, but just something to keep in mind as we go through the slides today. So just as a disclosure, I'm a graduate student at uh, GSU, so I have no current or historical fundings from any kind of uh, government or industry organization. And I wanted to talk today, I guess start the talk off today by talking about some general trends that we've been seeing in the United States in the 21st century so far. So if you look at the left graph here, we are talking about uh, the, the rate of prenatal smoking. So that's just like smoking during birth. And then we're also looking at um, the rise ultimately at uh, cigarette taxes over time. So the left axis here is the percentage of mothers who smoke during pregnancy. And that's gonna, you're gonna follow the blue line for that one. And you can see as the 21st century kind of uh, wore on here, the percentage of moms who ended up smoking during pregnancy has dropped substantially starting somewhere at about 12% and most recently 2018 has dropped to about 7%. At the same time, if you look at the right axis here, this talks about the average uh, cigarette tax on the county level in 2020 dollars. At the start of the 21st century, the tax was a little below a dollar on average, but as time wore on, it kind of steadily crept up to be slightly above um, $2. If you take a look at the left, the well, my right graph over here, this is also talking about pre-dale smoking again, but now on the right axis, we have this kind of indoor air law index. It uh, ranges from zero to one. And for now, what I'll say is that zero means that there are no indoor bans in certain venues. And one means that there are total bans in all venues. And what you can see here is that kind of as time has worn on in correspondence with kind of this drop of prenatal smoking, uh, this index has risen substantially um, from slightly below 0.4 and kind of topping out at 0.8 here um, around 2018. 
So what you might wonder is, are these kind of things related? You know, is this tobacco regulation kind of um, causing this drop in prenatal smoking? And there has been some research on that. And it's basically, it's mainly, if not entirely, been about taxes, so not about indoor bans. Um, but there has been papers suggesting that cigarette taxes can increase smoking cessation during pregnancy. There's also been research talking about the general probability of smoking during pregnancy. And these researchers here have also found that cigarette taxes reduce this probability. And again, there hasn't been much on indoor bans, but at least there's some evidence that comprehensive smoking bans can decrease the probability of, if you're an adult smoker, actually smoking inside the house. Um, and then you also have like children in your household. Um, and then we kind of want to shift gears a little bit to talk about the second outcome I'm going to be discussing today, which is infant death. Again, if you take a, if you follow me here to the graph on the left, and this axis here talks about the number of infant deaths per 1,000 live births. And then that will follow the blue line. This rate has also been dropping over the course of the 21st century very substantially, uh, starting at a little below six and then ending at a little below five in 2018. And you can see that this drop is at least roughly associated with the rise in these measures of tobacco regulation. And so you also might wonder, you know, does this tobacco regulation, did this rise in tobacco regulation also kind of cause a drop um, in infant death in the United States? And there's been some research on that too. So there is evidence that there's a relationship, again, mostly about taxes and infant death. Basic idea here is that if we see these papers look at, if you see an increase in taxes during pregnancy, this ends up decreasing the probability or incidence of uh, infant death. And you know, for this audience, you might be aware that uh, smoking either while pregnant or you know, in the, maybe the first year of the infant's life or so has been strongly related to sun infant death syndrome. And that's exactly what this Markowitz paper looks at here in 2008. And she looks at how cigarette taxes and indoor smoking ban affects what I'll call for now on SIDS incidents from uh, 1973 to 2003 in the United States. And here she is just using a two way fixed effect model and her rough finding is that if you were to increase the cigarette tax by about 10%, you should expect about a 7% decrease in SIDS cases. And she also finds some evidence that comprehensive smoking bans in workplaces can decrease uh, sun infant death syndrome counts as well. So the plan for today is to kind of bring these two uh, strands of literature together um, into one paper. And there is evidence that um, for example, maternal smoking pre, before and after birth can cause infant death through a very large number of channels. I'll just list some here. Um, these include secondhand smoke, uh, preterm delivery, being born at too low a birth weight and so on. To give you an idea where the early estimate of this lied, um, this paper here in 1988, they were looking at Sweden, the, the whole population of Sweden for a couple of years in the 90s, I think, uh, I mean, in the 80s. And they found that infant death after, within 28 days after birth is 20% more likely if the infant's mother uh, smoked during pregnancy. So there does seem to be a strong correlation relationship between uh, smoking during pregnancy and um, infant death. So the question that we're gonna try to answer today is if we can make smoking more expensive and inc inconvenient um, during pregnancy, Will this lower the probability of infant death? And we think that, you know, there's a few ways that this might happen. The first way is that if we're gonna make smoking more expensive through cigarette taxes or inconvenience through indoor bans, kind of forcing people to go outside, uh, this may reduce prenatal smoking and then perhaps, you know, reduce the probability of uh, infant death. Um, and there could also be these other kind of channels um, happening as well. So, you know, we could be impacting postnatal smoking as well. Um, these tobacco regulations could also uh, lessen exposure to other secondhand smokes, such as other members of the household or even in the workplace. Um, and, you know, these 
these policies might also kind of be complementary, right? So maybe if I we can get a mom or someone in the household to smoke less, maybe the mom will drink less as well or something along those lines. So there's there's a lot of um, ways in which kind of these policies can work their way into impacting um, infant death. So by bringing these two things together, these two strands of literature together, we're going to extend Markowitz and other similar studies in a few ways. The first is that eventually I'm going to look at all forms of infant death, but SIDS is a very small portion of what constitutes the infant death in the United States. But today I'll just focus on SIDS because we're not quite there to, you know, um, making that link for other forms of infant death. I'm gonna study a recent time period. Most of the other studies that look at infant death study older periods in the United States. And we'll talk about later kind of why this might be important because um, there are a few papers suggesting that cigarette taxes in the 21st century just haven't been really as effective as they should be in um, reducing smoking. I'm also gonna use a stack difference and difference model. I won't go into this too much, but I'll try to give you an idea of why this is different from your typical difference and difference model. And the idea of doing this is we're trying to lessen problems with the traditional staggered difference and differences. And um, if you want to know about what those problems are, I would strongly suggest you know reading Goodman Bacon 2021, or there are plenty of slides or video presentations online discussing those um, and what was causing the bias in those estimators. So we're gonna have two primary sources of data for this paper. Um, the first source is from the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation. Uh, so this, this data source provides data on indoor air laws and cigarette taxes, and this goes all the way down to the city level. Uh, for the taxes that we're going to use in the paper, uh, we look at state and local cigarette taxes. And for the local cigarette taxes, we'll weight them up um, to the state level so we can observe them there. For indoor air laws, as I was kind of saying earlier, we construct this index. It's, it runs from zero to one, zero being the weakest and one being the strongest. And what it talks about is the percent of the state population basically covered by these bans. So the NRF doesn't give every venue, but it gives a lot. So the three venues we'll be using for these indoor bans are workplaces, bars, and restaurants. Each venue will be weighted equally. And the ARNRF uh, distinguishes between full bans, which would be like, you can't smoke inside, just like period in a restaurant, for example. And they also talk about partial bans. So that might look like if your restaurant has 200 seats, you have to have a smoking area. So because these partial bans tend to be kind of weaker, they're, they're, they're not as exactly restrictive, on smoking inside, um, those bands only receive about half the weight um, in our index. So if you want some examples of how this index might work, you know, say we have like state A, there's the, the state itself has enacted a ban in restaurants and bars, but not in workplaces. And no county or city um, in the state has their own ban laws. That means that the index would show us about a 67% coverage in the state or about the index actual numerical value would be 0.67. And then you could also think about how local laws play into this. So think about it, another hypothetical state B. So there are no state laws, right? The state government hasn't decided on indoor smoking bans in these venues. But let's just say that there's a very large city, maybe like um, Chicago, but that has about 20% of the state's population. And then that very large city has a total ban in workplaces, restaurants, and bars, then that would, that would give about 20% coverage for the state, or it would be about a 0.2 uh, on the index. So for prenatal smoking, infant death, and causes of infant death, we're going to be using the CDC's National Vital Statistics System. So this is administrative data given to us by the CDC that covers nearly all births in the United States. We have um, geographic information on the state and county level, and we have demographic information on the mother um, for most of the years that, are, um, that include race, 
marital status, education, number of previous births, and a few others. And so with this birth data, there's also these kind of linked birth, death, uh, infant data, infant death data. So it gives you all the information on the death certificate when the infant dies. And this looks about if this, this covers about the first year after the infant was born. So this captures about 86% of uh, infant death. And on this, on this form, then they start talking about, okay, how many days was the infant alive before it died? What was the determined cause of death? And so those are some other outcomes that we'll be looking at um, in the future. But in particular, um, this talks about, you know, did the child die from sudden infant destiny? So earlier on, I was kind of going on about the stack difference and difference thing. Um, it, it's, not, it's not a huge deviation for how things were done. I mean, so for example, what, how we're going to run this is we're going to have a treatment group. So we're going to look for a state where the policy we're talking about was implemented. And then for that state, we're going to try to find a whole bunch of other states as control groups. So these would be states with no policy change around the effective date for the treated state. What makes this kind of a stacked model is that we're going to take each treated state and its control states, and then we're just going to kind of append them onto each other. So to kind of uh, talk about how I did this uh, specifically, the first thing you need to note is that I have two different data sets for taxes and indoor air laws. So we had to run this like five step process for each of them. So the first thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to identify an isolated policy event. Um, so in that case, there could not, in the state that had uh, the policy event, there could not have been a change, let's say in taxes three years after the effective date, nor could there have been a change four years before. After we identify these treated states, we only keep the, the, the top 50% of them in terms of how much, how large the policy change was. This has been kind of a new strategy. It's not, it's not a new strategy, but at least at the very least, it's been used in the minimum wage literature where they talk about, you know, very large changes in the minimum wage and how that affects employment and versus very small changes. And the, the, the idea behind this, I think, is a good one. So we should expect that larger changes in the policy level should have a larger impact than lower changes in the policy level on the outcome you're looking at. So for each event, then we select this kind of group of control states. And there are two big qualifications here. The first one is that the control state cannot have had any changes in the seven year window that corresponds to the treatment state's effective date. And um, states that were treated earlier by using our own definition cannot be used as controls later. And so each event and the corresponding control states then make up a stack as they're kind of appended onto each other. And we do this for indoor air laws and we also do this um, for taxes. So the reason we do this, particularly the way we choose the control groups helps mitigate a problem where treated units that receive their treatment early in the study period sometimes are recycled as controls later on. And this can severely bias uh, the difference of difference estimator. So that's mainly the reason why we chose our controls in uh, the way we did. And then by stacking this, we can also have this kind of convenient thing where we're putting everything basically into period time. So policy changes for an event become affected in the first quarter of period year four. The beginning of an event starts, the beginning of the event is at the start of period year one. And then the end, uh, and then the end of the event is the last quarter of period year seven. We also have some other modifications to the data just to help, you know, make a cleaner estimate. So within each stack, uh, we drop the year before the tobacco policy becomes effective. What this helps, what this helps with, is that you don't want a mother to be pregnant, you know, um, before and after, like a tax change, for example. And so this provides a, a, a cleaner uh, pre and post period for our study. And then we're only going to focus on mothers giving their first birth. My guess here is that you know 
if you if you look at uh, mothers who are giving first birth, they may that's where we may find the strongest effect of these policies, because they wouldn't have fully interacted with the medical system at that point. So on this slide, what you're going to see is the list of treated states for the tax. One thing you can notice is that the, the group of states is fairly heterogeneous. And um, the year in which they're treated is kind of spread out throughout the study period. And we only kept very large tax changes. So you can see that they range between about 75 cents and a um, dollar. And each state has its own group of control states. And then this is how many uh, control states I gave to each treated state. So if I'm not mistaken, that's about over 100 uh, control states in total. <clears throat> in terms of um, summary statistics for the, the cigarette tax stack of data, we can start off top here with the outcomes I'll be looking at. You can notice that they're fairly similar, except that the treatment group actually has a larger proportion of smokers and they also tend to smoke more. If you look at the control variables I'll be using down here, and you know, there's a lot of them, um, there isn't exactly any huge differences that jump out. One thing you can notice is that uh, the index of indoor air laws is maybe slightly different between the two. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't think there are any large differences, maybe besides the control group has uh, a lot more, um, I guess, legislation that makes medical marijuana uh, legal, right, as opposed to the treatment group. But in terms of like age, for example, the mother's age is about the same between the two. Um, and the demographics in terms of race are not that different either. When you look at the treated states for indoor air laws, um, <clears throat> we have not so many here. And um, again, they're kind of distributed throughout the country. The change in the indoor air law index is uh, given here in this column. And because it's around like 50%, give or take, basically what that would correspond to is a state banning um, smoking entirely in one venue and then partially banning it in another. And you can also notice that there's not a lot of control, control states for any of these. And the reason that is, is because there's a lot of heterogeneity in indoor bans throughout the country below the state level. And it probably, I'm guessing, weighted up to the state level. And so it knocked them out as a potential control state. In terms of, um, Summary statistics for this stack, for this policy stack. Again, we see kind of a similar uh, pattern here, right? Uh, that, you know, any prenatal smoking, the average amount of cigarettes per day during pregnancy, they're higher than the control group. A couple of things to note, however, that will be brought up later. The first is that in the control group, the real cigarette tax is reasonably higher than in the treatment group. And then, so this average is taken over the entire like seven year window. So even if the treatment group had large changes in their indoor air law index, the average is still quite low, particularly compared um, to the control group. And what this might suggest is that the treated group actually had little to no band coverage before they implemented their change. You can also see the treated states are fairly unique in other ways. They have no Tobacco 21 regulations. They don't have much of anything, you know, regulating e-cigarettes. And they also have little to no uh, marijuana legalization relative uh, to the control group. But uh, the ages are the same and there is um, a difference in racial demographics. The treated states are overwhelmingly white um, while the control states seem to have a fairly even split between white and um, Hispanic. Sorry about that. Okay. So for each policy separately, the first thing I'm going to show you are these graphs. 
And these are like uh, what are called event studies. So the idea is, is that, um, before I jump into it, there's a lot of sub indices here. So we should kind of walk through those. I indexes, you know, you're the person who gave birth. K is the events that I was talking about later. S is the state that I lives in for event K. And then T indexes the year quarter of conception for pineal smoking because we have to look at the laws, you know, before the birth happened to see how it impacted smoking during pregnancy and for birth for the two infant mortality outcomes, general and SIDS. And for birth, the idea is you want to condition on the infant being born alive to see how the policy impacted um, its health outcome. But in the, in, the, in the pictures I'll show you soon here, um, after the pause, the, uh, this is the coefficient that we're going to be looking at, which is this B to the J I K S T. And this is, this is an indicator that if you're a treated state in some uh, events, so if you are treated, you get a value of one, then if you're not, you get a value of zero. And this B is going to happen at each period time J. So it will start at like negative 12, which is like the full four years before the effective date. And then it will end at 11, which is the full three years after uh, the effective date. And at each J, what it's going to tell you is the difference between the outcome variable in the treatment and control groups. So we also have these kind of year quarter indicators and we do that for each event. And then we also have state indicators and those are also given for each event. We also have a whole host of, vec of uh, controls, which I was showing you on the summary slide um, a while ago. And then we have four main outcomes we're going to look at, that it be infant death, the probability of prenatal smoking, prenatal smoking intensity and sudden infant death syndrome probability. And finally, um, we cluster our standard errors at the, uh, at the state level. So I'll pause now here um, for any questions. Thank you, Max. So let's uh, go to our discussion today. Uh, Catherine first to see whether she has any comments. Great, thank you, C, and thank you, Max, for this really great talk. I just have a couple of comments now that uh, maybe you can address. Uh, my first question was, I'm wondering if you have thought about maybe doing a power analysis for your mortality effects. There's a really nice paper by Kosali Simon and her colleagues that kind of gets at this issue in the context of ACA Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. and it just talks about uh, sort of the type of variation that we have in these um, binary treatments and what that might mean for power in the context of looking at a more rare outcome, like uh, like a mortality outcome. Uh, she's, uh, I'm not sure the paper's been published yet, but it came out about a year ago as a working paper. Have you thought about doing some sort of power analyses in particular for the mortality effects? I think that's a great idea, um, you know, and this is this is still kind of early on. And I, I thank you for suggesting that, actually, because I wouldn't have thought of that by myself, probably. Um, but I think I'll definitely take a look into that paper and see if you know it applies to our context and do something like a power calculation. I think that would be a good idea. Sure. I'm happy to send you that paper if you'd like. They've got some nice code there that can uh, that researchers can utilize. Um, I guess another question I had is I really like your local uh, your local event study. Um, one thing, this is kind of conflating two ideas, but I think it makes sense. I was looking at your trends, um, and I like that you were showing these, but broadly it kind of looks to me uh, like the, the policies going up and the outcomes going down. I know you're going to carefully control for uh, the time-fixed effects, but I guess what I'm thinking is, you know, do we think that we are kind of capturing sort of these two trends are just kind of moving in a different direction. One way I thought about maybe maybe getting at that or also just adding another dimension to your local event study is, I think what you're doing here is you're looking at an increase in the policy. I'm wondering if, um, perhaps not for the smoking bans, but maybe for the taxes, if you have any decreases over your study period, then what you could just do is you could just keep your, your control group the same, and mm -hmm. then you could use, but your treatment, your treatment groups would be states that actually see the decline. So in one sense, this kind of allows you to look at uh, an asymmetric effect. You can compare your increases to your decreases 
in the taxes using the same design. Your treatment groups will be different, but your control groups will be the same. The other thing is maybe maybe it might speak to a concern uh, like I've just raised with the two trends that seem to be moving in the opposite direction. If you're looking at sort of a change down and you find that the symmetric effects that in the local up, the local increase and the local decrease event studies. So that's kind of conflating two ideas, but at least in my mind, they are related. Yeah, so I, I think that would definitely be a good idea. And I'm not sure about taxes going down, but I, I do know there were repeals for bans. Um, as, as to how, as to which bans got repealed, I, I can't remember. Um, it's been a while, but I, I know there were a lot. And it's, it's good to keep those into consideration. So I, I think looking for symmetric effects actually might be a good way of kind of making this more robust in that sense. So I think, I think that's a good idea. Great. Um, and I just had um, a, another question, a clarification question more so about how you're defining the treatment and control groups. Are you just removing the small changes? I know you're focusing on the big changes in the analysis, but are the small changes just there, you kick them out? I do, yes. Yeah, um, we. I was just going to say very quickly that we don't have a really good idea as to what constitutes a big or large change. So I just decided to go with like above the median and the distribution. So. Yeah, and no, it's often hard to get a good uh, barometer on that. Uh, it might be nice to see some sensitivity at some point. And I guess I just had a question. What about changes that occur for 2000? I know you're kind of stringent, which I think makes sense about when states can be treatment and control. Uh, but what if, say, you have a large tax hike in the 90s? Can you still be a treatment group or control group in your study period? Do you think about those, those changes that occurred before your study period began? I, th I think that's a great point. Um, and you're definitely right because I, I don't exactly know what the, what the trends looked like before 2000 because we kind of just cut it off in 2000, but you bring up a good point. So in our, in our study, if you were had a, like a large treatment before 2000, for example, you could still show up as a treatment and control um, in, our, in our paper here. So that might be definitely something worth looking into. One final quick question. There is a paper um, that might, you might want to think about when you're estimating your standard errors. It's Furman and Pinto, um, 2019, Restat. They get out some ways of uh, clustering standard errors that have been applied within this uh, stack DID literature. So I'm happy to send it to you, but it just might be a nice robustness check robustness check against your, I uh, hear your clustering at the state. Some people are concerned, like maybe that's not sufficiently conservative uh, in this context. So I can, I'm happy to send you this paper. It just might be a nice check on your standard errors. Yeah, I think that would be great. And actually, that's one thing that I'm going to mention probably at the end here is that, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting the hypothesis testing correct here. And, you know, the Sengaz et al. paper, I believe, used the same methodology you're asking about. So I think that I would be very welcome to have that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, there is also one question from the audience, um, and they want to know what happened in two, 20, uh, 2003 that uh, we see substantial drops in province taxes and indoor bans. I think this is referring to the trends that you presented at the beginning of the talk. Yeah, let me, let me pull those back up. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, for the bans, it definitely could have been um, a repeal. Right, and, and there were there were a, a few of those, but I can't remember which years those were. But the tax, I, I don't know. I know there was maybe one or two repeals, but as to how it would have gone down, I, uh, I'm not certain. It also has something to do with how I'm adjusting these for inflation. Maybe there was a, a strange year in there, but I'm, as of right now, I, I really don't know. Okay, so the, um, I actually have a, one follow up question here. So you, the tax trend here, you did include the uh, tax hack back in 2009, right? The federal level tax increase. Correct, yeah, the, the federal level is not in here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. I think uh, that's all the questions I see. Um, yeah, you can then continue to the next segment. Thank you. That's... Okay, so the next thing I'm going to show you is basically what these event studies look like graphically. The, the big thing we're looking for is that uh, what will end up being the blue dots are uh, fairly similar to each other in terms of their level on the graph. 
And then we'll observe what happens to the orange dots uh, after the policy becomes effective to see what kind of uh, effect this treatment is having on the outcome. So this is what I was talking about. Uh, so we're going to start with any prenatal smoking. So this is just a binary variable. So one, if you smoke during pregnancy and then zero elsewise. So for the, this is the event study for cigarette taxes. So we're looking at conception. So what that means is that if you were like here, for example, that means that uh, if that means that all the moms in this quarter, for example, gave were uh, conceived basically two quarters after the policy became effective. And so in the pre-period, all these blue dots here. So this is before the tax became effective. You can see that they're fairly similar and kind of hovering around zero. And then in the post period, we see that the tax doesn't really have any clear effect um, on prenatal smoking. For the indoor air law for like a large change, we see in the pre-period that again, these coefficients are somewhat similar to each other. And in the post period, we see a substantial drop. So this would suggest that uh, large indoor air law changes can be at least somewhat effective in decreasing the probability of smoking um, during pregnancy. For taxes, um, I'm sorry, for the intensive margin. So this is like the number of cigarettes per day um, during pregnancy. For taxes, again, we see a very fairly flat uh, pre-period before the effective date of the tax. And then the post period, again, the, the kind of the orange dots, which represent the coefficients are just um, kind of hovering around zero. But for indoor air laws, we see a similar pattern, but perhaps even a little stronger. So the blue dots are again, somewhat um, flat in the, uh, the pre-period. And then in the post period, we do see a substantial reduction for multiple quarters um, in the number of cigarettes smoked per day during pregnancy. And most of these coefficients are uh, significant. So what that would mean is that, is what it should mean is that the, um, the, the confidence interval bar here, which is the line extending out from the dot, um, doesn't cross zero. But when we move on to infant death, that's kind of, um, we see a similar, and we also have kind of a break from what we were seeing. So one similar pattern is that in the pre-period for cigarette taxes, it doesn't really look like much is going on and that kind of extends into the post-period. And remember the outcome here is just a binary variable, just did the infant die or didn't it? And then in the pre-period for infant death, it appears that about two years before the coefficients were significantly greater than zero. And it kind of seems to be a break with the uh, coefficients before that. This would suggest that the treatment group is having different um, behavior in terms of infant death than the control group, which is a concern for any difference in difference estimator. But if we look in the post period, the coefficients, which again are the little dots here, seem mostly um, flat. So now we're gonna look at sudden infant death syndrome. So the outcome is one, if we recorded the infant die of sudden, sudden, infant, sudden infant death syndrome and zero if not. The pre-period here, um, again, for cigarette taxes, it just, it's flat and it, it's, it's flat afterwards. But um, for the pre-period for inf sudden infant death syndrome, again, we have this kind of trend where it appears as if the treated group has uh, substantially higher probability of sudden infant death syndrome than the control group about two years out. But we do notice that, you know, there might be some evidence for a reduction. I mean, none of these coefficients are conventionally significant and they are a huge break um, from the trend beforehand. So that's pretty much it for the main results. One thing I will do is I'll give you kind of a, um, in a, a single number estimate. What it will end up doing is it'll average the level of these orange dots here, and then it'll subtract from it um, the average of these blue dots here. And so what that'll give you is an estimate of the expected effect of passing um, a large indoor air law ban.
So here's where these numbers. So we'll start um, on the very left column. If you take a look at indoor air laws, this is about, um, so how you would read the coefficient here is, is that if you pass, if your state passed a large increase in indoor air laws, we should expect about a 1.4 percentage point drop in the probability of smoking during pregnancy. And so that's how you should read the coefficients presented here in the table. Um, for cigarettes smoked per day, um, the expected drop is significant and it is in magnitude very large. It's about half of the sample mean. We can't find evidence um, for infant death, but for sudden infant death syndrome, it does seem like there is a significant decrease and its magnitude is very large, so over 100% um, of the sample mean. One thing to keep in mind is that this may have happened simply because of the large upward um, click in the treatment group in the pre-period, which made the post-period look very um, much less by comparison. So here's kind of how we're supposed to review um, the results that I guess I presented. So it appears that large indoor air law coverage increases. So this would be about a, a 40 percentage point increase or greater in the index. Definitely seems to have an impact on prenatal smoking. So we would expect about 0.179 less cigarettes per day during pregnancy on average. So that's about uh, five cigarettes a month or about two and a half packs for a full-term pregnancy. And further, when we do this, we also leave in non-smokers. So their, their outcome in this would just be like zero. And this represents about a 50% decline from the sample mean. There's some evidence that there's, there might be a reduction in infant death, at least that's what the point estimate told us, but it was not significant. And then there was also some evidence that there was a substantial decline in sudden, sudden infant death syndrome. However, what you'll notice in the table throughout that entire kind of top row, and I didn't talk about it much, was that, and I, I believe this also showed up in the event studies, there wasn't really much evidence that a large tax change could impact prenatal smoking, general infant death, or sudden infant death syndrome. And I, I feel like that's a bit odd, kind of given, given the literature I was discussing at the beginning, where it was saying, you know, cigarette taxes have the ability to decrease infant death or sudden infant death syndrome. And our findings kind of tie into this newer literature like Callison and Kastner and Hansen et al, where they're talking about that cigarette taxes appear to have, have a much reduced or non-significant impact on smoking behavior in the 21st century. But Given our other finding with indoor air laws, that kind of begs to ask the question, why were there no effects, why were there no detectable effects of cigarette taxes, but there was an effect of these kind of large indoor air law uh, changes? So we have a few thoughts. One might be is that, you know, if these tax levels became just unwieldy, right, this might drive people to start crossing the border and purchasing cigarettes in border states that might be at a much more reduced price. Um, another thing is, is that perhaps the only smokers left in the United States or the vast majority of them are these kind of hardened smokers who are very addicted and therefore don't really care much about the financial cost of smoking. But one thing that we thought about or we were kind of discussing was that, you know, indoor air laws may have been fairly new for all the treated states. Taxes have been around for a very long time and maybe this kind of new sudden increase in indoor air law bans kind of reset smoking expectations for you know, a group of health conscious individuals that we're looking at, which are pregnant women, right? Who very well may have been already on the margin of considering uh, quitting or at least reducing smoking. And I think there's some evidence at least for this point here, for at least the treated states, because the, the lower average over time suggests that these treated states had a very low initial level of ban coverage. These treated states also didn't have much of any e-cigarette e legislation. They didn't have any tobacco 21 laws. They had little to no marijuana legalization and they also have a lower cigarette tax. So 
this kind of just sudden increase in a ban in these states, which have little to no regulation, you know, discussing cigarettes or their close substitutes before, uh, may have come as a surprise that could have caused this sort of reset effect. So there's still a lot of work to do here, um, as I was kind of discussing at the break. So one thing that we wanted to do, we did this initially, but you know we had to redo the methods, so we haven't gone back to. It, is that you know there's a lot of different kinds of moms in terms of like you know their education, their race, how old they are, stuff like that. So um, we're definitely going to have to try to look at maybe this, these effects differed by your your demographics. We definitely want to look at additional causes of infant death, um, and there are others out there that are at least claim to be associated with prenatal smoking or postpartum smoking. And then we also want to look at timing of infant death. You know, is, is this stopping infants from perishing up front, like right after birth, or is this something that's kind of maybe preventing it later on? We also want to see, you know, what kind of smoker is being impacted by these events. So we want to create alternative outcomes of cigarette smoking, such as like, you know, did you smoke like half a pack a day or were you smoking a pack a day? To kind of understand what sort of you know smoker is mostly impacted, and then as you know I was discussing at the break um, that you know we probably need to consider strategies to adjust standard errors to compensate for the relatively small number of treated units which we may have um, noticed in our summary statistics table. So uh, that's all I have for the presentation. Thank you, Max. Um, so we'll invite uh, our discussant, uh, Catherine, again to see whether there are any additional comments. Thank you, C, and uh, thanks again, Max, for this great presentation. I do have just a couple of questions that I'd like to ask. Um, I guess what I'm, I'd like to hear you talk about is, um, I think it was the top bullet on the last slide, uh, where you mentioned that you're not finding much impact of the cigarette taxes and that's in line with some newer work. I guess what I'm wondering is, I agree with that statement, but there also, you do cite the papers by uh, Simon, Friedman and Rees, uh, the Edwards papers earlier on. And I think that the dates of some of those studies suggest that there's at least some overlap in your study period with those older studies. And, and you know, the Friedman and Rees study is recent. Have you thought more so about is it is it simply these differences in the years that you're looking at that is driving the heterogeneous findings where you're finding null and other studies are finding some effects? And I guess on top of that, you begin your study period in 2000. Perhaps data limitations prevent you from going back farther, but could you kind of explore this more so and do so, sort of a direct comparison with these older studies that is looking at their study period? Or perhaps it is the simply the differences in identification strategies, where I believe those older studies were utilizing the two-way fixed effects regression model with the continuous treatment, and you're utilizing these local event studies where you step around some of these these um, uh, issues with bias from heterogeneity. Yeah, I agree. So I, I honestly think it could be probably all three of them. Um, you know, for my my field paper, I was talking about in my PhD program, I was talking about prenatal smoking, right? And um, what we did there was we basically just, we tried to, I actually tried to follow Friedson at least, right? So the main thing about their paper is that cigarette taxes may not matter if we're only looking at like conception, right? But what if we looked at like when the mom, the cigarette taxes when the mom was like 16 years old or something, right? Like maybe the effect of cigarette taxes grows vastly over time. Like we have to just wait 10 or 20 years Right till, till we finally see the impact, and um, and I and I think that that's one thing that we might want to try to do here, but we just have to be cognizant that uh, the the vital statistics system data is is not a panel, right? So we're going to be introducing measurement error, and that we don't exactly know that the mom was living in like the same state, for example, you know, some twenty years ago, and we can try to limit that by looking at uh, younger moms, and I think that's something that maybe we might try to explore here. Um, I like. I also like the idea of looking more back in time. If I'm not mistaken, the vital statistics system data is available on the county level pre-2000. I could be wrong about that, but I think we only really needed the uh, restricted data for post-2000. But again, I, I would have to check on that. But I think that would be a, a good way to kind of sort out 
you know, what exactly went wrong here? Is it just because it's a new time? Is it because of the methods, right? I think because there are multiple problems that could be going on, I think adding those additional analyses would help clear up exactly if we're kind of fitting into this new literature or um, something else is happening. I think that would be a really a very important um, contribution, just kind of speaking to it. Is it the methods? Is it the time? What is it? Another thing you could also do is you could estimate the two-way fixed effects regression model just to compare, to help you do that diagnostic to see what's exactly driving the difference. Because I think it's an important finding that you could really speak to in this paper. So I think it would be fantastic if you could do that. Uh, I think I'm going to also uh, dovetail with a, a comment from Justin White. I'm wondering, can you also look at birth rates as an outcome? Maybe that's somewhere in the paper that I missed, but it might be interesting to see if, I think Justin's mentioning something about miscarriages, but that might also speak to are the policies impacting the births that are occurring, which might lead to compositional shift, which could impact how you interpret your regression coefficients. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we went with date of birth is because we wanted to condition on the infant being born alive. Um, we could definitely look at birth rates. I didn't put it in there. And I think that's a good idea. Um, if you're gonna look at something like stillbirths or like fetal deaths in general, we can do that, but it'll be a bit tricky. So states don't fully report the number of fetal deaths that occur, even if they have a certificate for it. Um, they have these kind of minimum reporting requirements. So like the fetus had to be like, so many grams or and the estimate of gestation had to be so long. Um, so if we were to do that, we'd have to do some kind of, uh, I think it's like a Tobit regression or something along those lines to talk about censoring. But I, I think that would be a good idea to look to make sure like there aren't any kind of like compositional things that are driving it or to see if there are, that, that might be interesting. Yeah. I think you've thought more deeply about the complexity of modeling this. I was just thinking something simple like a birth rate, but that all sounds uh, really helpful. Uh, I guess I have just another question too. Um, I think it'd be really nice to see these models without any control variables, because uh, I know this the new DID literature is just vastly moving on, but there is a new paper by, I'm going to say their names very incorrectly. I know that to Christensen and D. Uh, they had an earlier paper where they had developed an estimator for uh, the two-way fixed effects regression models with uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. They've got a new paper where they point out sort of the, you can get some issues with um, when you have, you can get contamination when you have controls. This is kind of in the spirit of Sun and Abraham. Uh, so it just might be nice to see either you build up the models from just the fixed effects to adding in the different controls and also just seeing each of the, uh, seeing just sort of seeing just the policies and the fixed effects. I think that would be a nice way to speak to that issue. Yeah, and I, again, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, that, that is a hesitancy I had about adding all these control variables in because if they don't have the same impact over time, they can bias your estimator. Um, so I think it would be good to show that to make sure that kind of thing isn't happening. And I think it would be really great too to also kind of have more of a discussion um, about sort of those relatively large effects you're seeing for the, the deaths um, and kind of compare them with the your findings for smoking. I just think kind of contextualizing that to help readers think about you know why why those effects are so large and kind of working through what you see in your kind of your first stage and working that through to your second stage. And I realize there's a lot of mechanisms that could be going on. It could be other people who are changing their smoking behavior in the household. They're kind right. of fleshing that discussion out more. I think will help your readers um, feel more confident about your, 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 your mortality effects. Alongside, I do think the power analysis would be very helpful there because mm -hmm. if you look at the work of Gelman, he will speak that he will speak to the fact that you know a sign, one si sign of an underpowered study can be um, larger coefficient estimates that are precise. So I think bringing that all mm -hmm. together is really gonna help strengthen um, the, or strengthen the story that you're telling to your readers so we can just feel comfortable with, with the story that we're hearing. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great suggestion. I would definitely wanna look into that. And finally, one other technical issue with border control, just because you brought it up and I work in this area and I get border control questions all the time. I think it would be really nice if you could kind of address that empirically. And I, I'm, I'm sure you folks are thinking about this, but there are some ways. Kyle Butts at the University of Colorado, um, I think he's at Boulder. He's got a nice sort of just method of how you can uh, apply some interactions and th that would work well with these newer procedures like your stack DID. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could also sort of think about con uh, throwing away border localities. Uh, anyway, uh, those are just some thoughts. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I think there is one question from the audience um, asking how do e-cigarettes fit into your analysis? 
So I guess on top of that, I'd be interested in asking, you know, uh, whether e-cigarettes and its uptake or its, you know, a uh, growing trend uh, gonna affect your analysis and conclusion. That's a great question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Pesco is actually working on a paper looking at how indoor vaping restrictions are affecting um, maybe prenatal smoking or infant death. Um, I, I, I think he's trying to deal with that uh, separately. The best thing I can tell you in this paper is that um, I, I tried to control for as many e-cigarette policies as I could. But nowadays with the difference in difference literature talking about like, um, you know, you got to be careful about your controls. I don't know. But I, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, like those graphs I showed you at the beginning, right? I mean, we, we saw that prenatal smoking was falling over time, but it could very well could be that prenatal smoking would just shifted to vaping, right? And so I, um, I haven't really looked at the vaping rates among uh, pregnant mothers, but I, I certainly say, I would imagine that it has something to do with, you know, what's going on here. Thank you, Max. All right, well, it looks like we're out of questions and we're almost out of time. Um, so thank you, Max, for your presentation. It was excellent work. Um, and thank you to the moderator and the discussant as well. I think we had a really good um, presentation today. Um, finally, thank you to our audience of 77 people for your participation. And I hope you all have a top snatch weekend. <laughs>